Obrigada. Obrigada. Olá, muito boa noite. Sejam todos, mais uma vez, muito bem-vindos a esse colóquio de filosofia. Meu nome é Ricardo Xavier e eu sou professor da Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, do Departamento de Medicina Interna. Eu sou um médico reumatologista, fui colega de turma do, do Marco Antônio Azevedo, organizador desse evento, e realmente eu gostaria de agradecê-lo pelo convite, é uma honra muito grande estar participando. Eu já tive a oportunidade de participar desse colóquio em, em as sessões anteriores é, e sempre realmente me admira muito é, o trabalho que o Marco vem fazendo e sempre que eu venho aqui, eu não sou um filósofo, não tenho nenhuma formação especializada nessa área, estou mais envolvido com pesquisa, tanto pesquisa básica quanto pesquisa clínica, mas sempre quando eu participo desses colóquios eu, eu aprendo muito e como tem sido hoje, também já tive a oportunidade de assistir algumas apresentações à tarde. Eu vou estar na, apresentando para vocês, então, uh, o professor uh, Michael Lufflin, que ele é um filósofo interessado nessas questões uh, subjacentes sobre conhecimento, valor nos cuidados da saúde. Uh, seus trabalhos né, foram mais assim, do ponto de vista de crítica, uh, da teoria de gestão, uh, em minar a autonomia profissional, levantando questões metodológicas né, sobre medidas de qualidade, bioética uh, e uso das evidências da política na saúde. Ele defende, então, a abordagem mais de virtudes para a sabedoria prática. Seu trabalho mais recente sobre epistemologia médica levanta questões sobre a cientificismo e o realismo moral, defendendo uma concepção humanista de racionalidade e ciência na prática. Ele é o editor associado do Journal of Evaluation in Clinical Practice e preside o Grupo de Interesse Especial em Filosofia de Saúde para a Sociedade Europeia da Saúde Centrada na Pessoa, European Society for Person Centered Healthcare. Recentemente recebeu um prêmio por seu trabalho original sobre a PCH, tendo sido escolhido para organizar um volume sobre filosofia nessa abordagem humanista e humanizadora sobre os cuidados em saúde. O livro conta com a colaboração de pesquisadores da Europa, Estados Unidos e, e também do, do Brasil. Né? O Marco Azevedo, a Bianca Andrade, né? Estamos presentes né, nessa sessão, estão preparando também um capítulo. Então, a, a, essa é a apresentação, o professor vai estar então discutindo a, com a gente sobre ética, a, o racionamento né, envolvido nessa questão da Covid-19. É interessante, assim, só colocar como reumatologista, a gente acabou a, estando envolvido diretamente em muitas das questões da pandemia, acho que como todo mundo, né? Mas a, a gente teve uma questão sobre, uh, que ocorreu sobre o racionamento, que foi, um, de certa maneira, um racionamento forçado. Porque nós temos nossos pacientes com doenças imuno-inflamatórias crônicas, como artrite reumatoide, lupus eritematoso sistêmicos, uh, que eles são usuários de hidroxicloroquina. Uh, e no momento, então, que explodiu toda essa questão da hidroxicloroquina, uh, o fármaco praticamente desapareceu de mercado, o valor foi multiplicado por cinco, e nossos pacientes perderam acesso né, de uma hora para outra a essa medicação, que é importante para manter a doença sob controle. A gente teve vários pacientes que reativaram a doença por causa disso. Depois, quando a hidroxicloroquina ah, começou num esforço né, que foi feito, né, a hidroxicloroquina voltou ao mercado e aí voltou com uma série de estudos ah, onde se discutia a toxicidade da hidroxicloroquina. É, principalmente toxicidade cardiovascular, cardíaca, né, questões de é, os pacientes desenvolverem arritmias, é, e essa toxicidade a gente simplesmente não, não observa, a gente usa né, há anos é, e nunca teve é, problemas, a gente nem faz eletrocardiograma nos nossos pacientes antes né, de se usar hidroxicloroquina, mas o que, que aconteceu agora foi que os nossos pacientes expostos a toda essa mídia né, ficaram, começaram a ficar com medo de, também de tomar hidroxicloroquina. E aí muitos pararam, descontinuaram e também por causa disso tiveram reativação da doença. Então, um exemplo assim de como a pandemia realmente afetou vários aspectos né, da, da saúde, às vezes de maneira até indireta. E também a gente tem sido envolvido bastante no manejo da hidroxicloroquina, no manejo da, da Covid-19, porque muitas das medicações que estão sendo testadas são medicações que a gente já usa na nossa prática clínica, também para manejar as nossas doenças imuno-inflamatórias, como 
ah, o Actenra, né, o antiintervacina 6, anti-TNF, várias das medicações que estão em testes hoje são, são da nossa área e também isso a gente esteve envolvido para tentar também ajudar na, em algumas pesquisas a entender a fisiopatologia ah, ah, dessa infecção viral. Então, ah, ah, sem ah, mais discussão, vou convidar agora, então, ah, Michael Laughlin, Uh, please, uh, have introduced you, some of your work, also some of my work. Uh, now it's uh, up to you. Please. Right. Okay, so is everything, so can people, uh, am I sharing my screen? Can people see my screen now? Yeah, Hello? Right. Yeah, so you can hear yes. me okay, and you can see the title there, Triage, Rationing and the COVID-19 Pandemic, yeah? Yes. OK, thanks. Right, yeah, you know, let me know because it's, it's kind of weird for me because all I can see is my screen. So I'm talking to these people who are all this long way away from me and I can't, I've got no evidence of their existence. Um, so, OK, so thanks um, for, for inviting me. Um, I hope this makes sense. My apologies for, you know, the standard linguistic ignorance of the British. Um, who have no, you know, no ability to speak any other language than their own, and that, in, in that sense, that's something I share with other uh, British people. So I have to give this in English. I hope it makes sense, and I will try to be as clear as possible. But people can raise questions if there's things I've said that, that don't that, that, that don't make sense that they can't understand. Um, so the title here, Triage Rationing the C19 Pandemic, uh, Philosophy and Practice. Really, that was I that was the title. I just went with the title that was initially suggested. Marco, I think, initially suggested a title that said, OK, I'll go. I'll go with that. Um, I feel a little bit embarrassed talking about triage because, you know, I'm not I'm I'm ignorant of such matters, really. I'm not um, you know, I'm not clinically qualified. There'll be colleagues here who know a lot more about triage than I do. Um, but um, I think it's important to the way that these concepts have worked to distinguish triage and rationing and the way these concepts have worked in the philosophical debate uh, about rationing and to look at some of its applications to the current pandemic. Um, so basically, as I understand it, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, but triage simply relates to priority setting in the context of an emergency. So war, uh, accident scenes, disaster. Um, and I've got a set of references at the end. So hopefully my as I click on the, you know, the, the slides, they are they are show you are seeing what I'm seeing here. Again, if, if nothing changes, then someone come in and tell me because something's gone wrong then. So triage that says, you know, priority setting in the context of an emergency. Um, so there's references at the end. I'll send the whole the, the whole presentation to the conference organizers so that they can, uh, you know, if they all want the references, they can have they can look them up. Um, so basically, I mean, this reference, this is just from a standard medical dictionary, uh, classification of patients or casualties to determine priority of need and proper place of treatment. That seems to be this notion of triage. We're not really dealing. It's not nothing to do with. It's not an aspect of philosophy. The, the form of reasoning here is clinical reasoning. You are looking at medical need and the effectiveness of treatment. You are thinking about those things. Um, and deciding who to prioritise based on clinical reasoning. Of course, there's a background moral assumption, uh, but that's simply something the, the incredibly uncontroversial assumption that there's an imperative to meet needs effectively, which I think you know most of us, whatever our different positions, would agree with. Now, again, you know, others might know better than me in this, but I understand the term triage it originated in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, Dr. Larre, um, and initially. The doctor replying this distinguished patients into three types, basically. Uh, those, you know, because he was dealing with people on the battlefield, so it was a you know the, cl the classic case of an emergency situation. Um, someone who's likely to die regardless of treatment. Then you had to think about patients who were likely to live regardless of treatment, and then you use your clinical judgment to see those who were, you know those patients category three where immediate treatment may make a positive difference to the outcome. Now clearly if you have no patients that fall into categories two and three then you may as well treat the patient in category one 
if you're fortunate enough to, you know, to have that situation, you know, you, you, you do your best. But the point is, if you have a patient who falls into category three, you prioritise them over the patient who falls into category one because you're more likely to make a difference there. Now, of course, this is still this is what you call means end reasoning or end is presupposed here. It is the moral assumption to meet needs effectively. Obviously, where triage and the discussion of triage slips into the concept of rationing, is in situations where you have more than one patient who falls under category three. Now then you start to engage in what's has standardly become called rationing, um, where clinical criteria are not sufficient to determine the choice that you make. So you have you know, two patients who both you can say both of them that their immediate treatment could make a positive difference to the outcome, but you have to decide which one to prioritise, which one to treat first in that kind of emergency situation. Now, it's this kind of um, issue that has given rise to the rationing debate and that a lot of you know, there's been a lot of applied philosophers have got involved with this debate. So hopefully people are still seeing the screen and moving on now. So the next thing coming up should say the ethics of rationing. Again, someone shouts out if they can't see that. Um, so there's a lot of work being done in this area. Um, and again, I've, you know, I've been I've raised concerns about it. I've been critical about it. I don't want to be disparaging of the of, of, of work in this area. I mean, it's, I think it's intellectually serious work and it's, you know, by and large is very well motivated. Um, but it's given rise to what's sometimes called medical ethics or healthcare ethics. Um, or indeed the title bioethics has been applied and some people use you know, people use these terms differently but bioethics is largely still thought of as a branch of applied philosophy those there are some there are some bioethicists who've claimed I mean I know that Michael Cotto for instance that it's a, a diff, different discipline altogether now it's on its own in some way um, now the methods that are used here I mean it's, it's consistent the analysis uh, of certain moral dilemmas and the application of ethical reasoning to these moral dilemmas. And so the, you know, the famous phrase, the trolley problem. Now, this one of the organising groups, am I right for this conference, is called the trolley group. That's that's right, isn't it? Um, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so obviously this is a well, very well known example. You know, you've got this situation, as I recall, you know, where you've got, you can, you can, you can change the direction. This trolley, it's, it's the tram has gone off on its own, and it's it's going to it's going towards a larger group, and you could change, you could pull the lever and change its direction so it goes towards a smaller group of people and kills or injures fewer people. Um, and there are questions about what you should do, and there's all sorts of issues, obviously, about you know the action versus omission and things like that come up as part of you know. It's, yeah. And of course, there are all sorts of other applied ethics debates of this source, you know, which you know you're you're in the burning building and there's th there's three people who are unconscious and you can drag out one of them and which one should you choose to drag out if you can only get out one of them in time that sort of thing and people raise have debates and raise questions about this and the idea is that these somehow extend to the kind of emergency situation they're not just made up problems that they you know unfortunately and, you know we've seen this in certain countries we were just having a conversation earlier about what it's been like in Brazil but you know in other places where people have had to make horrendous decisions about who to prioritize where it's you've some patients are likely to die because you've made a decision to prioritise someone else. Um, but of course, we've seen the debate about rationing extend beyond such immediate and obvious emergencies. So the rationing debate has taken on a much broader notion. Um, discussions about the funding of essential services have been important. Um, so Questions about, you know, if you're a health service manager or a health or a politician and working in the health department and you can you can allocate resources in one way or another and one group of patients are going to suffer and perhaps die. Uh, depending on who you decide to allocate resources to, that there's been a big debate which moral philosophers have got involved with. And I don't want to sort of give away some, you know, some of my political background here, but it seems to me that, you know, it's interesting that you know, Marx might have expected that you would have a huge debate when um, the economy dictates that certain groups of the populace uh, must suffer and die 
uh, because of the way the economy is structured, that you get groups of, of those of us working in moral philosophy trying to find rational solutions to say which group ought to be to you know, provide principles to decide which group ought to have to die in those circumstances. Um, and we've seen, um, you know, increasingly over the last few years, debate about bedside rationing. The idea, you know, that um, clinicians and other frontline health workers, it's not just health managers, but should be making decisions about, you know, how to allocate resources to patients, not necessarily simply to sort of go for the best resources for the patient in front of you, but to think about what you're doing in the context of the broader system and to build in economic criteria into your decision making. Um, and, there's a and I'll get into that. There's been a debate about that, which I was recently involved with. Um, but basically what these approaches have in common is that the notion of priority setting in the context of the whole health system. In some sense, there's, we should each of us, if we're working in the health system, think of ourselves as part of a broader whole. And that particularly comes into frame when we talk about the bedside rationing debate. But and I'll, I'll quote some recent authors who've made these comments and why they feel this is important in the context of the current uh, COVID debate. So hopefully that makes sense so far. Um, it is strange for me because normally I'm used to looking at the audience and getting sort of, you know, you can just see from the way people are looking whether what you're saying makes sense or not. Um, but so, so, but what I'll do, I want to talk about, you know, my broader concerns about this. And it seems to me, and something which uh, Mark has asked me to, to, you know, I've, 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 to make a contribution to publication on this. Um, so, What's the role of philosophy in practical debate? Because I, as I've sort of argued elsewhere, we want to make sure that we actually, you know, our reason for being involved is because we want to give something positive to the debate. What we, you know, and we certainly don't want to do any harm. We certainly don't want to, to, to actually, we want to clarify things if we possibly can, not to confuse them further. Um, and we don't want to, you know, serve any, or, or, you know, inappropriate agendas. We want to do something that's positive. Um, and it seems to me that, there's been two conceptions of applied philosophy that have developed over the last few decades and it's worth distinguishing them and thinking about what we're doing when we do apply philosophy and what we think its positive role is going to be. Um, so the first of those conceptions um, involves broadening debates and I say here apply traditional philosophical methods to matters of import so things that are important so um, is applied philosophy you know, simply the name that we give to the activity of philosophy when done in the context of certain types of debates, those that we think are practically important in some way? Um, and certainly there are many of us who don't apply philosophy who thought of it in those terms. And in those terms, its methods are something we're familiar with. Um, you know, it involves revealing underlying assumptions and background conceptual framework. So it involves asking a lot, well, let's face it, asking a lot of questions. You think back to the Socratic dialogue, what is the philosopher notorious for is asking the sort of annoying questions that other people don't ask and continue asking, you know, what do you mean? Why does that follow? You, 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 know, you know, looking at your you know, our process of reasoning and arguments, why do we think, why, when, when I, I draw a particular conclusion from a certain observation, why exactly do I think that follows? Are there any other conclusions and so forth? Um, and Socrates, you know, was, was, was you know, obviously is very famous for this. You know, you think about the typical Socratic dialogue. Someone is talking about uh, holiness and the nature of holiness in the market square. And Socrates shuffles in and says, "Oh, I'm I'm very very pleased to uh, meet you, sir, because I don't know what holiness is, but you obviously do, because I I'm told you've had four members of your immediate family arrested for unholy behaviour. So you must know what holiness is. So can you tell me?" And the person gives him his definition of holiness, and Socrates is like. Oh, I'm puzzled now. If holiness means that, what exactly does that term mean? And isn't there an inconsistency? If it, and, and he will, you know, he will get, he will broaden the debate in a way he will challenge the person's assumptions. Now, in this sort of traditional conception of philosophy, uh, the the bioethicist of the recently deceased, isn't he, Dan Brock, um, who wrote that really influential book, Life and Death, in the 1990s, philosophical essays in biomedical ethics. Now, Brock says in this traditional sort of philosophy, nothing is immune from questioning and criticism. It says, uh, you follow a line of reasoning wherever it goes to its logical conclusion, even if that means challenging assumptions 
uh, that until now were treated as too obvious to question. And Brock thinks in a philosophical seminar, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that way of doing things. And what it leads you to do is to look often beyond the parameters of initial characterizations of the problem. So um, from the point of view of, you know, I can imagine if you have any any management theorists in the audience or whatever, they, 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 this is the, why philosophy is not seen as practical to certain people. You know, not, very rarely does a Socratic dialogue end uh, with a summary of established conclusions on say the net. You know, the, here are three key, the three key features of holiness, which we'll just write up on the board now. Everyone remember them. That's what holiness is. And then now we're going to develop a five point action plan on how to increase holiness throughout the Athenian society. Um, no, it doesn't end like that, does it? It, it? it rather it ends with a sense that the questions raised so far are inextricably bound up with other questions, ones that quite often we still have yet to answer. And so the attempt to focus on specific claims doesn't lead to a simple conclusion. It often leads to the need to expand or remap the conceptual boundaries to get a more accurate understanding of what the real problem is. Um, so this is where we get used to the notion of critical thinking. And there are some of us, you know, the idea I've, I've often I'd, the last time I gave a, a quote, a, a talk to colleagues in this area, I think I quoted J.S. Mill on how critical thinking is society's best defence against tyranny. And I still think there's a lot to that. People asking difficult questions, critical questions, being willing to revise conceptual maps, perhaps. Um, and so I what in one of the my I'm, I'm shamefully that I'm quoting my own publication now, you don't start from here. Um, it's about it's saying that often you may get to the conclusion, you know, when someone says, what's the right solution to this, that's the other problem? You, you say you don't start from here. You have to revise your view of what the problem is in some way that, you know, if we've been taking the legitimacy of certain underlying assumptions or some underlying social institutions or underlying structures, if we've been taking them for granted, we have to first of all rethink them before we can start to find the real and meaningful problem solution to our current problems. And again, I think you know, I'll try and say something about this towards the end, but the, a lot of the really interesting stuff that I've been reading on the COVID crisis is coming to conclusions like that. Yes, there are immediate dilemmas and problems for people, but to really talk about solving the problem of this pandemic, we have to think about how pandemics get started in the first place and the kind of world we've created that that leads to this sort of mass crisis. Um, now, obviously, this traditional application of philosophy, there are a number of concerns with it. And of course, I quoted Dan Brock's book before because Brock is very you know, good at raising these concerns. Um, so Brock comments on his uh, role that he had for a while as, a, as the staff philosopher on um, a presidential commission to discuss the ethics of end of life issues in the American Health Service. And he notes it was a presidential commission and he notes that there is a danger because of your philosophical training, there is a tendency for philosophers who, do, who apply philosophy in this way to set what he calls unrealistically wide agendas. And he, I think you can see why, given what I've just said. Um, you know, the, the presidential commission is not going to say, well, you don't start from here. That's not that's not the solution that they, they want. They want a five point plan, if possible. They want an action plan uh, that you can't say, well, it all depends on A, B and C. It all depends on, you know, uh, there are certain questions that we need to answer these broader political questions first. The audience, as Brock says, that he was speaking to here on his presidential commission, they want answers. They want you, you to use your expertise to supply answers to the specific questions they have. Um, so there's an associated failure to influence decision makers and address immediate problems, Brock thinks, if you take this standard philosophical line. So it's fine in the, in, the, in the philosophical seminar room, it says, but you know, we have to put aside some of these academic ways, as he calls them, when we enter the policy debate. He says there is a need to write then with a more realistic understanding of the constraints of political reality. Now, Brock, I think, is very influential. He's obviously not the only person that's been influential of this, but this this kind of thinking, I think his is a particularly good um, and revealing um, example of this kind of thinking. Now, 
it's given rise to a whole area, it seems to me, of bioethics, uh, which is developed. And, you know, this co and I'll give you some quotes from some authors and some people on my references at the end, where it's clear this, this has developed into a distinct form of philosophy altogether from the first one that I've just sketched. So I'm putting up here point two. You know, so it's the, what this is, the second type of applied philosophy um, as a distinct branch of the subject. It's not just philosophy as it happens to be being used when discussing certain issues we deem important in some way. Um, it's a distinct branch. Its focus must be on quite specific problems. So you need to get, yeah, get the problem as clear as, as possible in the first place. And you are providing practical advice for decision makers on those problems. Now I'll quote a paper uh, that was published a little while ago in the Journal of Clinical Ethics. I got myself, I was drawn into a debate. I was literally drawn into it because the, there was a writer, a clinician called um, Vegar Vila, who invited me. He said he'd read my stuff and he invited me to join this debate and come in on his side and rescue him. He thought from being shouted at by some of his colleagues in bioethics. Um, and I ended up getting involved with the debate with some interesting authors, Morton Magelson and his colleagues, um, and the, their reference at the end. But basically, from their perspective, it was clear that um, you know, this branch of applied philosophy has to be pragmatic in the sense that means it needs to give determinate answers to, quest to the questions, what should I do? Which decision is right or, or just in this situation? You must be able to say, what the you know, give a determinate answer so a lot of the time you know i'm i i would be seen as not pragmatic because someone would say to me you know if i have to save this patient or that patient and they both you know i could save either one but not both i don't i personally i would rarely feel qualified to tell them which patient they should save you know um if there isn't any argument as to which is more obviously likely to benefit from the treatments i'm not sure what to say um, and you know, if I was pushing out of a burning building, similarly, I'd I'd look at the particular. The, if there was three people on the floor, I might say, well, she looks the most lightweight and most likely to get hair out, and pull out the, that person or something like that. But what I wouldn't be doing is saying, well, she's younger, um, but you know, I happen to know he's a very important guy in the charity world. You know, you wouldn't be doing that. So, but you know, you need to give, if you're to enter into this debate, you need to give conclusions that are pragmatic that tell people how to make one decision or another and to give a determinate answer, not to say, not to shrug your shoulders or say it's arbitrary or you don't know. And they also have to be realistic. That is to say, they have to be solutions that work given the world as it is. And Magelson and colleagues are very clear on that. You need to be pragmatic and realistic. So you have specific problems. You want advice to decision makers. Well, decision makers can mean all sorts of people. They can mean practitioners. They can mean the authors of guidelines. Um, they can mean managers. They mean politicians thinking about allocating resources. And there are methods which I think are quite well known. So generally, the application of theory, uh, theories of value, theories about rights and justice, and you know, famous theories of deontology, utilitarianism, and increasingly virtue ethics. For a while, it used to be just deontology and utilitarianism, but over the last few years, bioethics have brought And you are looking to apply these theories to certain specific, clearly stated, practical problems. And Madison and colleagues note this. What this process is supposed to do is replace intuitive, emotional or sentimental reactions with what they call impartially applied general principles as a basis for priority setting. So there's a notion of generality that and as I said, it's linked to notions of just my immediate gut reaction. You are supplying people with generally defensible answers. Now, there are different examples of this, and of course, you know, everyone knows, or a lot of anyone in the area of bioethics, presumably, has heard of principalism, you know, the, uh, you know, the amazingly successful book, Beauchamp and Childress, The Four Principles of Bioethics. Um, very influential, health economics. 
the health economists have had a huge input to this area, things like quality of life measures. So Alan Williams who invented things like the quality adjusted life year. Um, that's been a huge influence. Certainly, I know that in Britain, and I'm sure in other health systems as well, there's a, the, 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 this has been very influential. The group NICE, as they're interestingly called, you know, the National Institute for Clinical and Healthcare Excellence, um, they make a lot of decisions about rationing in the UK. And they use quality measures, which is why you know, there are certain groups here, particularly because length of life is a big part of the measure. A lot of the times, if, you know, if you see large groups of elderly people on a demonstration in London, it's likely that they're demonstrating outside of the nice offices because, you know, I remember seeing a demonstration like that, it was because, you know, services for them have been deprioritised because they're considered too old to be buying much quality of life. But equally, you try to measure um, the quality of life for specific conditions and there are controversies with that. Obviously, it's a, it's a controversial issue, um, but it is used. So there are lots of applications for these ways of thinking. Um, codes of practice and guidelines will often use some bioethical methods and there are, you know, ethics committees, bioethicists will sit on ethics committees. We've already seen you know, one of the, you know, the, an early example of that with Dan Brock, who sat on a very important government committee. But there are research committees, there are committees governing practice in different areas and various professional bodies. These days, you know, almost every organisation has its ethics committee. I think there's even, you know, there's even an ethics committee at the car phone warehouse. Um, you know, the, the, every organisation has to say, you know, that it's conducting its policies in an ethical manner and has to have some procedure that it uses to show that it is doing so because it may, you know, it may be challenged. Um, so we've seen rise of ethical advisors and consultants and these terms are used and I think I cited, I quoted uh, Michael Cotto before, he does characterise himself in one of the pieces he wrote as um, an, a consult, an, an ethics consultant, an appropriate consultant for certain decisions in healthcare ethics uh, and he thinks that bioethicists in this context can help to make practices he said, more morally excellent, he says at one point, or ethically excellent, pardon me. Um, obviously, it gives rise to monitoring cultures and professional life to ensure greater consistency in practice. The idea is to get consistency very often across different practices, and different decisions. And this includes development of national agencies. I've already mentioned in, in my country, NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, but the agencies to make provisions based not on local capacities, but on centrally agreed priorities. And this, well, there was something, I don't know how this applies in your country, but certainly there was, it used to be a debate a number of years ago about something called um, postcode rationing and post the postcode lottery and the thing is that certain services will be available in certain parts of the country and not others so if you had certain urgent medical needs and you happen to live in the northeast of england you were more likely to get treatment than if you had precisely the same condition but lived in the southwest and the idea was to make the whole system more just you would make rationing decisions across the border now it's still the case then that some patients lose out but what happens is this the more consistent the overall system is, it means that if you have a particular condition and it's not treated by the National Health Service in Britain, then that means you don't get treatment wherever you live. Whether you live in the northeast or southwest, it doesn't matter. Whereas if you have a different condition, one that has been nationally agreed, then you will get treatment whichever of those districts you live in. Now that gives the, certainly the appearance of greater of, of greater consistency, doesn't it? And this, it's so, so it doesn't seem as arbitrary a process, but nonetheless, there's still some people because of the condition they happen to suffer from, which is no fault of their own, who don't get treated. Um, they just can't think, oh, if only I lived in Bogmer Regis now, I would get treated. Um, but they still don't get treated. Um, so it has the you know advantage of giving consistency, and there are you know certain um, yeah, you know, the system appears certainly to be more less arbitrary. It, it, it reduces the appearance of arbitrariness, um, and it can be useful to practitioners. And I'll you know, to some reasons for that. To have, you know, it can be very useful to practitioners to have central guidelines. Um, it can have, as we all know, you know, monitoring cultures can increase costs as well. It can have certain disadvantages. Um, certainly, research ethics committees, and some anyone here who's a student or supervisor may know this. Um, one of the 
well-known unintended side effects of the Department of Ethics Committees has, mean it's has meant it's actually made it harder for the voices of certain vulnerable groups to be held in research. So at the moment, I've got a student who wants to do work on epistemic injustice. Um, she wants to talk about what a group they're called in the UK looked after children, children with certain types of very difficult problems. And she wants to point out how their testimonies aren't taken as seriously as the testimonies of um, other people. And of course, because she wants to speak to those children, it's very difficult for her to get ethics approval because they're a vulnerable group. And it's difficult to approve from her work or from the institution. And she's, it will be much easier for her to simply seek the, the opinions of senior professionals. So there are interesting side effects to some of these cultures. Um, now, before I go on, is that okay? Is people still hearing, hearing me okay and seeing the screen okay? Yes. Yes, oh good, thanks. So thanks for that. I just wanted to make sure before I move move forward. So uh, hopefully it's making some sense. Um, so applications in the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, there's calls for binding guidance on emergency rationing of critical care. So there's an interesting opinion piece in the uh, BMJ by Cognon and Regmi, um, and they were arguing that we need, as a matter of urgency, more binding guidance. And we need this in particular for the legal protection of professionals. You know, you, you want, you, you're going to be making some difficult, perhaps horrendous decisions. You know, you're going to be, you know, as, as, as we were talking about before the session starts, you know, certain clinicians in certain parts of the world have had to make decisions whereby, you know, which patient you put on the ventilator, where you know this other patient will die if they don't go on this, but you think this patient has a much better chance and so forth. And there are all sorts of questions which bring in the sort of debate that Dan Brock was involved in, sort of killing and letting die debates about can you take someone off a machine and put somebody else on to make them better because you think they've got they you, know, you think the second patient is much more likely to benefit than the first but you have to take the patient off and you want protection from that because at some point the family of a particular patient could start saying who was the person who signed that form that took my relative off that machine um so they're saying you need to have central guidance and it's also very important from their point of view that the overall system must be perceived as just. And they say that on numerous occasions. This is one of the things that interests me about this whole debate. It's very important, I think, that we see ourselves as part of an overall system, our decisions as part of the system. And they quote um, some experts in medical ethics and law, uh, another paper that I put down there, to, uh, uh, Thomas and colleagues, um, who say, who talk about the COVID situation, say in an open democratic society, we must confront these horrific questions to reach specific answers we can all accept. And, you know, you can see the way that these these two papers argue the case, it does seem very important for professionals to feel that they have, you know, it would be great to have some clear guidelines as to what you should do and shouldn't do in certain situations, if for no other reason than so you can go about your job without worrying that you're going to be prosecuted for this. Or called a you know or, or discipline for it. Um, that said, that pragmatic use of it aside, there are some intellectual questions about the discipline itself which I want to raise. And there's one really obvious one which follows from that last quote from Thomas and Co about reaching specific answers that we can all accept. If we're doing this by applying ethical theory and ethical thinking, then there's an obvious objection to this. So say, however. Now again, I'm quoting Emmanuel. Uh, uh, I put them in this as well. Pers had my old comrade Ross Upshaw from Toronto, who argue to make the point, which we all surely recognise, and certainly Thomas and Cogan and Regmi and Co recognise this as well. Numerous contradictory approaches to prioritisation can all claim to be justice-based, impartial, and reasonable, and yet they can give you different conclusions about what you ought to do. So we know there are controversies in, 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 in medicine, but everyone knows that in moral philosophy, the controversies are particularly clear and you have equally credible theorists can come to completely opposing conclusions on particular issues. Uh, and so how you then decide, you know, having an, a group of ethical theorists decide something, how that is going to determine a specific conclusion on which we can all agree, to say the least, isn't clear. 
And of course, Cogan and Regmi realise this and they make an interesting point. They make a distinction there between all accept and all agree. They say, look, what Thomas says, Thomas and colleagues say, is not actually all agree, it's all accept. So we Michael, can you hear me? I was. Because I, we're not hearing. I, I'm not hearing. Uh, I'm not hearing him too. Some problem with your sound now, Michael. Something, something gone wrong. The volume is too low. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, can't can't hear you, Michael. Uh, uh, Ricardo, uh, o pessoal da organização tá tá achando que ele tem que sair e entrar de novo. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you can hear me, yeah. but uh, the technical guys are telling me that probably it's better that you get out of the, of the room and then come back again. Okay. Try to log off, Michael, and then log back in. Me too. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. I don't know okay. Right. I don't know why that was. I should, I, when did I when did I get cut off? You, you, you. Shall I try and share the screen again and go back to it? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. you can. Yeah. Yes. yes, please. Okay. You can share okay, your, your screen oh. again. Oh, right. shout out then if you can't if you can't hear me again. So um Right, I'll try and share the screen again. Oh, it's saying bad. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can see your your screen sharing. OK, thanks. So I just put up. Had you heard up to I'd said about this distinction between all accept and all agree. Had you heard that? Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi, yeah. we, can, we can hear yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, you can see yeah, around here. Yes, we saw that. Okay, so, it was around. so basically, what I'd said was I was interested in this distinction between this conclusions that we can all accept and that we can all, and, that to, and the decisions we can all accept and decisions of which we can all agree. And the problem is, um, you know, as I say, I was interested to see, you know, it seems as if they seem to be suggesting that even though I might, some, there's this notion of personal, my personal disagreement, whereas if something comes about by the right process, there's some kind of proceduralist notion of justice going on here, um, that I can nonetheless accept the decision, because what matters is that the system is seen to work as a coherent authoritative whole. Um, now I have some, yeah, you know, I have some questions which I'd be interested in anyone you know, people to give answers to later. Uh, is this saying that justice is simply the perceived coherence 
of the system in some way. So long as this, so long as the, the decisions are all consistent to some principle, it doesn't necessarily matter what that principle is. Um, You know, and again, my sort of, you know, just asking naive questions here, but couldn't we just simply distinguish special excuses in emergencies from rational priorities? You know, if a clinician really had to make a decision as to which of two patients to prioritise, to give their place in the intensive care to, or to, and to put them on this ventilator, couldn't we just say, um, you know, you had, to, you had to save one of them, and, you know, that from a moral point of view, it probably didn't matter which, you know, you, you've got an excuse for not saving both of them, really. You couldn't, if that is the case. Um, and so, you know, do we need to say that there must be a correct answer to the question as to which one of them you should have saved? And as a clinician who'd done differently, would have done wrong by saving a different one? Do we need to say that? But the, anyway, so, you know, there may be questions about in what, you know, what we say in different contexts. But um, from a philosophical point of view, I'm not sure why there needs to be an answer to that. But um, we certainly see in the outcomes of this sort of this debate you know, as applied to the COVID situation. Lots of publication in recent years, in, in, over the last year, sorry. But what we've seen, certainly in my country, depriorization of the elderly, the, the absolutely rampant, you know, the, 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 destruction uh, that this pandemic has brought to people living in care homes. Um, also the disabled, so that there was a legal challenge by a disability rights group to the NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, their frailty scale, because they had a scale, you know, and again, if you look at the background to this, they're applying quality of life measures, and quality of life measures take a fairly simplistic utilitarian position with regard to, you know, the whole point of a quality of life measure is to say, how would you rate a full year's healthy life, however you determine that, from a year with condition X. So people with certain types of condition are seen to have more, to less quality of life than others. Um, and of course, the disability rights groups who would say that is patently discriminatory. How dare you say my life is so inherently less valuable than a so-called able-bodied person's life. There are all sorts of questions about that that have not been settled. Um, we've seen questions that, you know, virus measures have been seen in all sorts of ways, and there's a very good BBC report or reference on exacerbating systemic injustice. You know, um, and, you know, examples, racial disparities, the poor, uh, effects of on the global poor and the dispossessed groups like refugees have been particularly badly affected by this. Um, people with rare and expensive conditions. So um, and I fear that Magnus and Clive might accuse me of sentimentality. I actually signed a petition on behalf of this uh, boy to get him his treatment. Didn't work. Um, coronavirus blocked seven year olds cancer treatment. This was you know, basically it was a you know, priority sh decisions, shifted resources from certain areas and you know certain people with difficult and expensive conditions lost out on treatment as a result. Um, you can argue about those decisions. Um, and some, some you know, as I say, cognitive regmi will say, look, you need to have rational, some sort of centrally agreed rational criteria for such decisions because someone's going to suffer and someone's going to die. Um, there are general objections, though, to this debate. I'd like to sort of explain something about what they are and then see what people think about the solutions, you know, the, the answers to them. Um, so Vila, who I mentioned before, his objection to bedside rationing. Um, Vila is a clinician primarily who's taken an interest in philosophy. Um, Vila attacks the, you know, the, he, he attacks what he sees the standard assumption of most bioethicists who write about rationing. The first thing he says, well, rationing is inevitable. Um, it is, you know, it is a given, and that's the starting point for our, our debate. And Vila says, well, no, there are all sorts of things that we have to start with. In the sense, you know, we live in a very imperfect world. You know, the fact that I mentioned systemic injustice before and didn't have to explain to you what it was, ex you know, suggests that we perhaps live in an unjust world, that systems are unjust, and that we easily recognise that term. And Vila says, look, we should be open. If we're going to be clear and sensible and philosophical, we should be open about the fact that scarcity in the health system is a result of political decisions. It is not simply a given. 
We have a society where corporations make vast numbers of amounts of money that they're not taxed for. Um, all of that money could be spent on greater health resources. We spend money on armaments and all kinds of facile things. How many game shows do we need compared to how many beds do we need in intensive care? Uh, do we need to have another group of people making a fool of themselves and being laughed at by celebrities on their country's Got Talent? I believe there's a Got Talent programme for just about every country. I don't know if there's a Brazil's Got Talent, but there's a Britain's Got Talent, America's Got Talent, Norway's Got Talent, and they make vast sums of money on these ridiculous shows. And he's saying, look, Venus says, we live in an unjust world. He says, and really, I need, you know, as a clinician, he says, I want, you know, Give, give the clinician the clinician's due here. He says, I see my primary obligation. He says, you know, to whom is my primary duty? He says, in this unjust world, I see my obligation as primarily to the patient in front of me, not to the politician whose job it is to make the whole system tick over more effectively, or to the manager whose role it is to keep a particular budget within a specified limit. So he's objected to this notion that clinicians like himself should not just try to do the best for their patient, but should be thinking about their patient as one amongst many um, and, and not be sacrificing the interests of other patients to their patients. Um, he says, look, he goes with something he calls the ethics of proximity. He says the doctor's primary duty is to the patient in front of me. That's his view. And he tries to defend that view in detail. And he says, rationing culture diminishes our sense of outrage at the injustice of depriving patients of needed resources, because it tells us that there is some kind of overall coherent rational system that will make it, you know, while it's still regrettable, will make it the most just decision we could possibly realistically make. Um, and he says, I, he's not sure he wants to diminish our sense of outrage at that. He says that's not what he thinks of as progress. Um, now, OK. Obviously, Magelson and colleagues uh, respond to this. And I find their response very interesting because it was it tells about where the two different authors are coming from, where Vila on the one hand and Magelson and the bioethicists are coming from on the other hand. And they, they, are, they, they make it very clear that this is a distinct branch. They talk about the remit of the debate. And they actually, as I said, pragmatic and realistic, as I said before. So you need to distinguish, they say, practical from background issues to the debate. You need to distinguish your role as a health professional from political debates about over the overall funding of the service. And they said, look, you know, Vila is quite right and legitimate in his role as a citizen to argue for more funding for the health service and to make his political arguments. But they're not part of the rationing debate. The rationing debate, we're working within the system as it is and as health professionals deciding how we can contribute to the overall coherent functioning of that system so that we for the best possible outcomes, given the limits upon the system. Now, their thinking here about, about a remit, it echoes things that other bioethicists have said previously. And I think they say it more clearly and, ex and argue it better. Um, but Michael Cotto, in a previous debate I'd, I'd, I'd been involved with, um, again, I think I was dragged into that debate. David Seedhouse invited me to join him in this discussion. Um, and Cotto got quite upset with me at one point, I think. Um, but, Basically, Cotto says at one point that as a bioethicist, while he does can see himself as a consultant on, eth on ethical issues about healthcare, he, he says, why do he replies to a point David Seedhouse makes where Seedhouse said, we need to bring in questions about social justice here into this debate and broader political issues. And Cotto says, there is no reason to think that a bioethicist should be the appropriate consultant concerning unequal familial wealth and distribution outside of a healthcare scenario. So he's got a very clear conception of the remit of his debate here. Now, and of course, what he and the and Magelson and the Norwegian colleagues would, would take as obvious is that rationing is a necessity. It is unavoidable given the health system as it is. And given that we're trying to be realistic and pragmatic, that's got to be the context of our debate. So this to my mind brings out what I think is the thing that divides them from Velo, whatever we think of you know, the two different conceptions of applied philosophy at work here. Because quite clearly their, their rejection of Vila's position is methodological and they, they spell this out in a wonderfully clear way. Um, so they say a well-developed modern professional ethic ought to be able to incorporate and justify notions of justice and rationing. And they then comment on his ethics of proximity and say 
the ethics of proximity is unsuited to provide such an ethical framework for medicine. So effectively, they reject his position because it doesn't provide an answer to the question it, it, that they want that they want to ask. So on the one hand, he starts off with a particular ethical theory and he, he, he grounds this in Aristotle and other writers uh, and Levinas and people. And he defends his ethics proximity and uses that to say that there cannot be such a thing as just fair rationing at the bedside. But the very fact that his theory determines that conclusion is a good enough reason for them to reject that theory as not appropriate to this debate. So there's a methodological thing going on there with methodological assumptions to why that's why they get rid of him. And um, take it, people can still hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Yes. Uh, yeah. yes. I, just, okay. I just got a, a disturbing thing flashed up for a moment saying bad quality again, but as long as you can hear me, OK. Um, OK, so hopefully it means bad quality of reception, not bad quality of arguments. Um, I don't think the computer will be able to make that decision. Um, so basically, the, you know, the, the, they're referring back to you know, the, the, the necessity of this of, of rationing. It refers, it goes back to you know, the, the famous papers by health economists that like Williams, I mentioned before, designed the, the qual measures and the quality approaches, quality of life measurements and quality adjusted life year. In a resource constrained system, cost equals sacrifice, Williams says. So there's always going to be some constraints on the system. And so, you know, the bioethicist like Vila, sorry, sorry, the clinician like Vila, who just look, does the very best of his patients, Williamson, is just, you know, the system is resource constraints. So therefore, Vila is not thinking about other, he's not, he's sacrificing other patients than his own, basically. And that's then criticised as, a, as, a, as a, an immoral decision. Now, Magnuson and colleagues give a very interesting illustration of this. They talk about a situation where there was, it seems the Norwegian government could have spent on one of two things, reconstructive surgery for breast cancer patients or surgery for children with cleft lip and pallus. And they give this example. And I do think they're, they're, they're rather sanctimonious in their, in their, their tone that they take uh, with Vila. They say, look, there was, they talk about the fact that what had happened was initially the priority setting decision had been made and women looking having had mastectomies and wanting reconstructive surgery um, were not getting it. The health service in Norway couldn't afford it. All right, that was the claim that was being made. And so they said there was what they describe rather disparagingly as an emotive and heart wrenching campaign. They say uh, in support of these women where you had you know, demonstrations, lots of stories in the press about it. Women bearing their scars in, in public as part of the demonstration to make the points. And this got them, they, they, they got the government to concede. And I think they quite rightly think Vila will have been clapping his hands saying, well done to those women and their supporters for getting the government to spend on what they needed. But of course, uh, Magnus and Collins say, well, this had certain unfortunate side effects because, of course, what then happened was the health service was then instructed by the politicians who've made this concession simply on the basis of being upset by the bad publicity to save money elsewhere. And so they cut the spending on surgery for children with cleft lip and pallet. Um, and Magnus and colleagues say, so this is what we see happens when you have sentimentality and emotiveness as the basis for decisions rather than a public transparent rationing procedure and we would rather see the latter. So this is the point they make. Hmm. Now I found that hmm, I've, I have a few problems with that. Uh, I, I, how are they so sure? How they, they almost seem to be suggesting that, they, that this was obviously a bad decision. How do you decide between these two groups of patients? Yeah, I can only assume they haven't met people in one group or the other to think that that decision is in some sense obvious or that any public or transparent rational process would be would clearly decide in favour of the children with cleft lip and palace and against the women. I think you, you know that these are all human beings who have suffered appallingly and have genuine needs. Um, but what I find interesting is their assumptions out from this example. First of all, being practical means we must be able to give a non-arbitrary answer to just about any question it seems of the form, what should I do? That's what it is to be pragmatic. There has to be, and an, you can't just say, well, it really doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's, if someone tells me you have to, you really have to shoot one of two people. 
who who should you shoot? I'm supposed to look as oh well, you know, are we really going to sell that person's disabled? So we'll shoot him, not that young woman who looks able body. Hey, you know, that's at least controversial. You know, so well, on the Alan Williams scale, he's already got a lower quality of life. Um, you know, do we have to be able to give a non-arbitrary answer to any question of the form? What should I do? Don't some situations make such an answer impossible? Um, and they clearly assume that the spending on patient group A causes the sacrifice of patient group B because they talk about this as a side effect. The word effect is logically linked to the word cause. So what they're saying here is that the spending on the reconstructive surgery for the breast cancer patients is what caused the uh, cut in spending, meaning that the children with cleft lip and palate did not get the surgery they needed. That's that's their assumption. And they also make the point, which a lot, you know, this which comes up a lot in the ration debate, the Kantian phrase, ought implies can. Unavoidable suffering is deeply regressive. And so we understand Vila, you know, they're not trying to be nasty to Vila, you know, despite, I say a little bit sanctimonious at that point, but they're not being nasty. They say, oh yeah, he, he's, you know, he's expressing legitimate, you know, it's quite right that we should be very upset about things like this, but can't strictly speaking be called an in, injustice because you couldn't do otherwise. You would have to have cut to one of those groups. That's an inevitability. Um, now, so I, Vila asked me to come in and I gave a response to this. I'm not sure if they've given the counter response yet that I can report on. Um, but I basically wanted to examine their use of counterfactuals regarding the terms necessity and their concept of causal reasoning there. What they seem to me to be doing was assuming a nice, simple, Humean account of necessity um, where you say, you know, on causality, where you perform a thought experiment, you say, if the money, you know, they're saying, if the money had not been spent on the women uh, who wanted really constructive surgery, it would have been spent on the children with cleft lip and palace. Therefore, the spending on those women caused the suffering of the children. That's their, that's their conception there. Now, their assumed remit determines the, their accounts of, of necessity and causal reasoning in that case, right? Because, of course, their remit determines which counterfactuals they are willing to consider. They don't consider, to be pragmatic in their sense, they don't consider as many counterfactuals as Vila does, for instance. Um, so, you know, instead of performing that thought experiment, we say, had the health service had exactly the same budget, right? However, they had spent, you know, it, uh, it, they'd spent it on the, the, if they hadn't spent on the women, then they would have spent on the children. Instead of having, thinking about counterfactual, why don't you say, we assume, suppose that the taxes on Norway's Got Talent, the silly uh, TV show where people humiliate themselves in front of experts who laugh at them for thinking they have talent, um, instead of spending, uh, instead of less, you know, giving them such low taxes, if you'd increased their taxes by something like 2%, you could have easily catered for both of those groups of patients. So why not say the low taxation of corporations uh, owning, you know, shows like Norway's Got Talent is what caused the suffering of the children with cleft lip palace. But of course, you can't do that because that's beyond the remit of your debate because you're not thinking about politics. You're only thinking about spending within the real health system as it is, with all of its political structures as they are. Um, and then the question is, why should the person, he happens to be a clinician, but why should the clinician such as Vila accept that particular remit? You know, to be, why should he want to be part of their debate once we know what to spend that debate? Um, why can't he say, as a person, I'm going to think more broadly and I'm angry about the loss of the, you know, the funding to the children with cleft lip palace. If you tell me about that, I will have joined that demonstration as well. Um, why should he accept their limits on his thinking? So what we're seeing is a distinction between, on the one hand, the system as the starting point, the necessary starting point that we can't question, and the system as an arbitrary barrier to practical moral thinking. And that second way is clearly the way Vila sees it, whereas the way you know it's seen as a starting point given the methodology of Magelson and colleagues. Um, now, okay, and of course Vila would say, you know. As a philosopher, his notion of philosophy, I want to raise questions about the under, you know, underlying questions about the whole debate. Now, here's where I have the concerns, and I can, I'm trying to see the set, you know, why there's good sense on both sides here. But 
you know, obviously my leanings are one way rather than the other. And when I look at these notions of pragmatism and realism, I can't help but be taken back to Brock's initial thoughts on this. So Brock, you know, it's, and he gives, it's a wonderfully frank account he gives of his role in the Presidential Commission. And he says, well, look, in academic discourse, our role is to persuade other scholars by argument and evidence, and it's a common search for the truth. And you know, you pursue you know, the things I said earlier, you pursue the, the line of reasoning to its logical conclusion, so forth. He says, but in policy, discourse, you can't do that. He says, the goal is too often to persuade or manipulate others to reach a desired outcome. And to challenge certain fundamental ideas is to use up your credibility. Brock says that. You don't use up your credibility. You don't challenge assumptions that are too basic. So you don't challenge the underlying political structure. And even in his advising the committee on killing and uh, letting die, he, he, despite his own views on that subject, he hid his own views on that subject. For, he says that from the, pre, from the presidential commission. There were certain forms of um, ending people's lives. And he thought that, in fact, the killing, letting die distinction was not philosophically tenable. But he didn't argue that in the commission because he knew he'd use up his credibility straight away. Certainly in the United States of America, I think then and now, he would definitely use up his credibility if he'd said that. So instead, he the forms of uh, euthanasia that he wanted to get passed and approved by the committee, he construed them as forms of letting die. Uh, so he was basically, therefore, isn't he admitting that he was kind of dishonest to the committee? Now, the worry I have with that, you know, you know, it's interesting, he was hired as the staff philosopher, and yet his own account of the process suggests that it was his philosophical ways of thinking, what he calls his academic ways, that had to be put on hold in order for him to make the contribution to the committee that he needed to make. And so when I initially commented on Brock's work on this, I said, well, you know, has he considered then the selection, the criteria for selection of advisors and issues where advice is sourced? You know, there's a broader political background to this. It's no surprise that, say, the Clinton administration will get a progressive bioethicist like Brock to comment on end of life decisions in healthcare, but then the subsequent administrations of theirs didn't decide to, to uh, consult uh, radical anarchist professor Robert Paul Wolf before deciding whether or not to invade Iraq, right? You didn't take that one to the Ethics Committee, why ever not, right? So how much are we being politically realistic as opposed to ignoring you know, our role in the system? It's at least a question worth raising and being concerned about. Um, so the big danger with this second applied approach is that it can help to contribute to legitimation of the status quo, the way things are, because the involvement of academics can help foster what surely is the illusion that certain fundamentally arbitrary decisions are grounded in objective, impartial reasoning. So, you know, the very fact that something was authoritative on the, you know, the views of Cogan and Regmi, that it was the, the view of an official um, you know, committee, made it objective in a way that everyone should accept it, even if they had strong, well thought through arguments to the effect that it wasn't the right decision. Uh, everyone should accept it, even if they, for good reason, don't agree with it. Hmm. So the worry is there that you know that, that, that this can legitimise arrangements, background social arrangements that are fundamentally arbitrary. Um, and I, so I, I quoted one of my earlier words. This again, shamefully quoted myself here, but I said, you know, the worry I have there is that um, the work of the favoured theorists on the committees then can form another stick in the already impressive armoury of the powerful. It's, it, it, this is precisely the concern that Vila raised, that it can help to, you know, quell our distress and concern and anger about random arbitrary decisions just like making an old thing you know you have two conditions both of which are fatal and you know you make what you know you, you make what you know as i say in the case of the you know the uk system you make one of them treatable across the whole country then you 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 reduce the appearance of arbitrariness in that you know so oh, if only i'd lived in newcastle i would have got treatment for that but nonetheless it's still the case that two people you know both of whom have desperate needs one of them is going to get their needs met and the other isn't so, um, and yes, as you say, if you charged more taxation to Simon Cowell, um, you could have paid for both of them. So, what's the role of philosophy in this? Well, I, I quoted, in, and Vila was very pleased when I quoted this on his behalf. Um, Bernard Shaw talk, has talked about the unreasonable man. What he says is, he says, the reasonable man um, amends himself to the world adapts to the ways of the world, whereas the unreasonable one 
insists on trying to adapt the world to himself, to his own views. And then Shaw says, therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And what he's getting at there, you know, if we all just go along with things as they are, then they don't change. Whereas if we are unreasonable, if we are like Vila, a bolshie uh, professional, then we have a chance. You know, again, you've got to think hard about tactics. So sometimes when it is not. Again. <laughs> Michael, you drop it again. We can't hear you. Yeah. Espero que esteja tentando entrar de novo, né? Tem minha internet aqui que está ruim uh -huh. também. Oh. Am I am I am I back? Hi, Mark. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Yeah. Yes. You're yes. Have you heard? Okay. Hopefully. Right, so, so I don't know what you how much you lost of that there, but you know. Um, <clears throat> just just a little bit. Just a little bit. So, so sorry about that. I'll try. I'll try and I'll, I'll try and draw it. Anyway, so I'll go back to screen. Let's just see and go on to the right now. Um, now, where was I? Okay. Right. I'd say, so I'd say about that the danger is, as you heard that pass, I said the danger, as I saw it then, was the potential to be involved in legitimation of the status quo. But people heard that much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah, okay. So basically, you know, the worry is that the involvement of academics can help foster the illusion. Oh, yes, I'd said, uh, you'd heard that. And the, uh, so basically, had you heard that, I quoted Bernard Shaw on The Unreasonable Man. Yes, you'd heard that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. okay, right. So basically, okay. Um, the role, okay, so the argument then is, surely at least one important role of academics is to challenge boundaries to move debates forward. Um, so, you know, I gave the illustration, I said that, you know, you know, if you think about a time when, you know, slavery was legal uh, in many countries, I mean, obviously slavery still exists in many places across the world. This is part of the, you know, the horror of our current situation, really. But, you know, you think about if you were writing in, you know, pre-Civil War United States of America, um, a lot of people did say they couldn't get rid of slavery because it wasn't realistic given the economic system as it is. So should people have decided then to draw up, you know, an ethics of slavery? Because after all, some slavers are much better than others and some are much nastier than others. You know, as any slave, you know, slave in particular, so I hope you get bought by master so-and-so because he's not going to rape your daughter. Whereas if you get bought by this other person, he will do. Um, and so, you know, some slavers are better and worse than others, but nonetheless, would you really want to draw up a discipline with the ethics of slave called the ethics of slavery? Wouldn't that suggest that there was a possible way to be a just slaver, which they're sure as hell isn't? Um, and so, you know, we want to be clear that our primary role surely is in is in challenging boundaries. And, you know, the COVID-19 crisis seems to me, you know, can function as an illustration of the artificiality of boundaries. So of some of these boundaries and we've seen as I say in some of the debates I only and I realize I've gone over time now so I'll mention although I've been cut off twice so I haven't gone that much over um right the, the COVID-19 situation seems to me you know you, I'm getting the, you know a lot of interesting debates from people about you know which seems to me you know the broader approach is useful the borders between ethics political and social philosophy need to be looked at um so Possible, I mean, this sounds absurdly optimistic to talk about possible positive outcomes of the pandemic, but it would be great to think 
that we could lead to a shift in our thinking and to changing our conception of what is and is not practical. You know, a lot of us forget about the whole ways in which the system is it discriminates against people in poorer parts of the world. Continue, you know, people in the developed nations continue to live well while those in other nations li live in appalling conditions that generate all sorts of diseases. We have situations, you know, the way that food is produced is being looked at carefully, you know, and the sort of use of wet markets and so forth, um, economic and, you know, environmental issues. The mapping of the borders of health and social care. We all know that medicine is an important part of healthcare, but we all know that equally medicine has to function in the social context and bad social arrangements can make the best medicine in the world uh, can, can, you know, crumble because you can keep on creating these conditions uh, and challenging medicine to uh, develop cures for them. But we need to, you know, and part of the stuff that I'm doing on person-centred care is all about talking about how you'll map the borders of health and social care. Um, and, and look at you know, the broader social problems that create the terrible problems that we have. Um, growing recognition of interlinked issues, so global poverty, environmental injustice, interests of the developed world. Um, and that, you know, increasingly, you know, we're seeing that even you know, people in the United States of America might be seeing that you can't, you can't just dissociate your own interests from those. We're seeing a ter the terrible, horrible things happening all over the world in some of the wealthiest countries now. Um, and we, the, the wealthiest countries can't cut themselves off from the horror. And so at least one of the things as philosophers that we could be doing is trying to say, OK, you know, maybe we need a new world. And that, that broader debate should be something we're engaging in. I mean, I understand there can be times when you want to give more applied answers, but maybe, maybe specific answers as well. But whatever approach you use, you know, you've got to be aware of the dangers of those approaches. And so I don't know, I, I, can, I could leave it there and hope that makes Hope that makes some sense. And then if I stop sharing the screen, then, oh yeah, I say lots of references there. So you, I, I can give you, now let's see, if I get off this and stop sharing the screen there, right? Have I stopped, successfully stopped sharing now? Oh, I couldn't yeah. hear you. Oh yes, right. And so now I'm, so I'm still audible, but I'm no longer, my pictures aren't on the screen, yeah? So does that, I mean, okay, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there, but I thought, you know, Marco, you want to come with some questions and things and, and criticisms, but I thought, I, you know, I, I've got, you know, I was trying to sort of outline an overall position, some of the problems, and just see what, you know, well, see what, see what you think and see what people think. Right. Okay. 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 <clears throat> so, um, of course, if there's comments in the chat, I can't read them because I'm <laughs> too linguistically ignorant. So I can't. Actually, so I can't read. I can't Don't read worry. Them. Don't worry. All right. So, well, what do you? So, Are you okay? To, so I thought. So I, I thought I better leave it there, and you can come. You know, as I say, come in with any sort of questions or problems or whatever. Ricardo. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I have any questions. Um, Marco probably should uh, comment if if you want. Yeah, yeah, like. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, questions are well, Mike, are, uh, sorry. Uh, Michael, are you hearing me? Yes. OK, yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I will try to make a comment and, uh, and try to discuss the ideas that Michael uh, presented to us. Uh, in fact, Michael was invited by me and 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 Roden and in the beginning of the year, uh, I don't remember exactly what what uh, was uh, the month. The month it was April. I don't remember. And when Michael made a delivered a conference, and he introduced actually this uh, general idea. Now he uh, ex uh, 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 
presented them deeper uh, and more uh, uh, and, and, and completed and presented more uh, questions to us. Uh, uh, he sent to us uh, his paper as a contribution to our uh, annals uh, to the book that we are uh, that we want to prepare after the, conf the, 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 the two events. And uh, I've read it, and so uh, I'm quite impressed. Uh, uh, I know Michael. Michael is a person that is uh, very critical. And, uh, and when I uh, read and hear Michael in the, uh, 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 before, uh, my point first is uh, uh, try to defend actually myself because, in fact, uh, Michael's criticism uh, made me think about uh, what I and my colleagues are doing. Uh, let me try to make a, uh, a title for my uh, what I try to do now as a comment to Michael. Maybe uh, it could be a reasonable comment to Michael's unreasonable uh, man's questions about the idea and practice of practical philosophy. Uh, uh, actually, uh, the paper that Michael uh, uh, presented to us, uh, I, 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 uh, uh, the paper is The Assumptions of Ethical Ration and Unreasonable Man's Response to Magelson at all. And uh, he, he, he quoted uh, to us the passage uh, from Shaw. And it was quite quite interesting and quite uh, provoking. Uh, let me try to say some words, and uh, I don't think that the words I uh, will give uh, make uh, uh, an excuse for my point of a reasonable uh, uh, view on practical ethics. And actually, the, uh, Michael's view on the two kinds of applied philosophy, uh, I think uh, it's quite clear. And uh, if we try to uh, uh, reflect on what Michael said to us, uh, see, for example, uh, now in Brazil, we philosophers, uh, we are at, uh, in a, uh, in embarrassing and uh, situation because philosophy is seen by the the government, for example, and the ministry as a less important practice in the field of uh, uh, science, and uh, uh, and the humanistic now in Brazil are actually are seen as uh, uh, dispensable uh, uh, undertakings, and uh, we are trying to. Uh, actually uh, uh, present our research are more connected to the uh, priorities of the ministry. And this is quite embarrassing for us because uh, we as philosophers, I'm a physician too, uh, mm -hmm. as Ricardo, but uh, as a philosopher, we are uh, uh, more interested in deeper questions. And uh, uh, as, as, for example, Elizabeth Anscombe said, the ultimate questions of life, questions about uh, what the meaning of life, what the meaning of ethics, what the meaning of duty, and, and, and try to navigate uh, between different conceptions. Uh, uh, we don't try, for example, to solve the problem of the ontology and utilitarianism in philosophy, we, we, we are quite uh, uh, happy with having these uh, discussions. Uh, and this is philosophy in, in, in a sense. Philosophy uh, is uh, uh, an effort to discuss uh, perennial questions uh, about thought, about uh, ethics, about statics and whatever. And mm -hmm. so I think uh, uh, one point that Michael is making us to uh, thinking about is uh, if uh, the kind of bioethics that we are doing and the kind of practical ethics that in now, now in COVID-19 we are uh, asking for uh, make, uh, if, it is, if it is philosophy uh, uh, in a in the traditional sense of philosophy. Uh, so he presented to us that uh, the 
the other kind of uh, philosophy that want to discuss discuss uh, uh, questions about COVID-19 uh, as the traditional account. So this is traditional because this is the Socratic account. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, when Michael says that the, this is the traditional uh, account, maybe the the other kind of philosophy that is not traditional. Uh, and in, 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 yeah, of course, Michael is not a conservative. He's not doing this point as a conservative man that's saying to us, be, the, be traditional. No, this is not uh, Michael's point. Michael's point is, uh, 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 is think about what you are doing when you depart from the traditional uh, account. So, uh, in a sense, uh, when I hear Michael, uh, I, I, I see Michael as doing something I don't know in English. How do we say "puxar a orelha" uh, oh. or take a uh, tap on the wrist? Uh, Mike, uh, uh, saying to, uh, 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 saying to me, Marco, have you seen what you are you doing when you try to contribute positively to uh, solve some practical problems in uh, oh. practical ethics? Uh, and uh, I think I think you you saw what uh, uh, he said. Uh, uh, I said to Michael that I'm trying to navigate actually uh, between those two uh, kinds of approaches in practical ethics: the traditional and the practical. Uh, maybe I'm I'm trying to do uh, something in between. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in some, uh, uh, in several parts, I agree with Michael. Uh, 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 a couple of years ago, I think uh, more than ten years ago, I wrote a paper, uh, and the title of the paper was uh, uh, was this. Uh, let me remember why philosophy, why bioethics is not a part of uh, of philosophy. Uh, I try to say against some people, including friend of mine, including Darley Dallagnol, that I know, I don't know if Darley is hearing us in this moment, but I try to say that uh, people are wrong in thinking uh, that what we are doing in bioethics is philosophy, or that bioethics is a part of ethics in the philosophical sense of ethics. And I try to say that, uh, I remember that uh, my motivation uh, began began after reading uh, Stephen Darwell's uh, questioning about why ethics is seen as part of uh, philosophy because et ethics, uh, for example, uh, the part of ethics that is part of philosophy is philosophical ethics, as the part of physics that is part of philosophy is philosophy of physics. So maybe there is something uh, such as philosophy of ethics. But ethics, um, uh, Darwin uh, uh, thinks, uh, maybe is not a part as such of philosophy. And so he, uh, uh, I, I try to think about bioethics and and, and criticizing my my my, uh, my colleagues, including Darley, uh, in a sense. Uh, that bioethics is not part of philosophy. Bioethics is, and we see what people are doing in bioethics. What we see is maybe something more near than administrative law. For example, see bioethics committees or uh, research committees. They are not. They are not doing what we try to do in philosophy. They are doing. They are trying to solve administrative problems. Uh, and given uh, mainly by law, uh, and so uh, people from law uh, schools are more interested here in Brazil in uh, committees of research ethics than we philosophers. We have, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, no, no, we don't have so much philosophers in in this field in Brazil, and so uh, I, for example, uh, I don't think. Uh, quite interesting what we do in uh, research ethics committee. Marcelli de Araújo, my my student, maybe are hearing me, and he's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and she knows that uh, how I uh, don't like to do what we do in 
research committees. And so, uh, in part, I think uh, that mm, uh, I agree with uh, Michael that what we do now in applied ethics is quite different from what we think uh, is philosophy as a critical uh, thinking and a critical uh, 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 rational thinking. But in fact, bioethics is a multidisciplinary uh, field. And so uh, there is, there must be a part uh, in bioethics for philosophers at all. Uh, and we, uh, we try to see what we can do uh, in this field. Uh, bon, well, but uh, about the uh, specific field of rationing uh, the, or a, a specific uh, issue of rationing, I think mm -hmm. Michael uh, uh, is right uh, on uh, pointing to us that some uh, uh, conflicts are very deep and uh, maybe they are uh, quite impossible to solve. For example, uh, the point that uh, of Wheeler's uh, uh, criticism of uh, the idea of bad side rationing uh, uh, and uh, and his point on the ethics of proximity, uh, I think I think Michael is right about that. Uh, but uh, 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 in a in a sense, even Wheeler's point on bad side rationing is, uh, of course, a view on what the uh, discussion or the problem of rationing uh, can be approached. Uh, uh, and so uh, the point in, in, in of a, the point, the, the philosopher's point is not maybe uh, who is in the right side, there's uh, Wheeler or the uh, others. Uh, for example, the people that say that we and must have a positive solution to, to the problem of bedside rationing, or uh, Wheeler's point, uh, actually, that is that our primary duty uh, as physician, Wheeler is, is a physician, is not to the whole society, but to the patient. Uh, but uh, I was wondering if uh, when Michael think about the, uh, this problem of Wheeler's uh, position and the position of the other, part, the other philosophers that say that we need a, a positive uh, solution, if uh, we cannot have any positive uh, uh, solution about who is, uh, we cannot adjudicate about who is in the right side, or uh, uh, if our uh, attitude in philosophy is simply to analyze, uh, to present to the audience, to the audience, uh, the, the the conflict, the discussion, the 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 the, 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 the dispute under view, uh, and I'm not sure about what is Michael's. Uh, uh, approach about that, uh, uh, if uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, in other parts of his presentation, uh, that is uh, about uh, COVID nineteen tentative of uh, uh, of, uh, of me and and Darley, for example, Alcino and Marcelo, uh, when we try to present a positive solutions to the problem of. Uh, 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 rationing in the, the actually the, the, the ICU's problem uh, or the ICU's rationing problem. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, his view is that uh, we should, as philosophers, uh, what we sh should do uh, in, is simply not to try to uh, enter in this discussion. I'm not sure if this is his uh, criticism, uh, but uh, uh, for uh, let me let me present more uh, questions. Uh, for example, uh, I said to Michael that when I try to discuss those problems uh, as the problem of rationing. Uh, in uh, ICU about ICU beds, uh, 
uh, I said to him, uh, one hard problem that intrigued myself was why it seems more reasonable, at least to the common sense, to prioritize someone to receive, to receive a bed before others, given a, a reasonable criterion, for example, that uh, this is what maximizes uh, welfare or life, uh, uh, save more lives, for example. And however, after the allocation decision has been made, it seems wrong to remove the same person from that bed and give it to another uh, if we follow the same criterion. Uh, this is something that intrigued me. And I said to Michael, uh, in, discussing, in discussing those uh, very practical problems, I, as philosophers, became intrigued by this deeper problem about principles and about why people uh, are in, uh, uh, maybe intuitively inclined to accept one solution in, a, in one moment and to refuse the same solution in another moment. Uh, I'm not sure if Michael thinks that uh, thinking about this, that is a mystery for me, uh, is, a, is, a, is a problematic. That is simply uh, entering in the discussion. If we uh, enter in the discussion, we are uh, 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 have bitten the bullet in, uh, or uh, be uh, uh, about uh, talk, uh, talking about biting by biting by not, I don't know if in English there is this biting by the blue uh, fly, <laughs> something like this. Uh, Getting the if we are, uh, we are trapped by the the the. the predicament that Michael said to us uh, or, or uh, in, in uh, last uh, sentence, if we simply accept to discuss the issue, uh, even if you are interested more in uh, use this as an example of how to discuss principles, if we are uh, uh, trying to do something like uh, an ethics of ration that is equals uh, in his analogy to the ethics of slavery, something uh, deeply criticized and deeply bad. Yeah. I'm not sure if I, uh, if I uh, uh, quite clear for Michael, uh, but uh, this is my general point to his presentation. Okay, I don't know if you want me to come in and answer some points or do you want or do you want to wait and get other questions? I mean, I could come in and give some and, and, and respond to that. Is that? Is that what uh, you want? Yeah, we don't have any additional questions here, so I think you can we can go ahead. But I, I, I echo uh, Marco as a, as a physician. Uh, uh, I also uh, tend to think that uh, sometimes you do have to do a choice uh, and then uh, uh, you know, if, uh, if I have to do like a Sophia's choice in, in the movie, uh, I had to choose uh, one of the kids, you know, to, 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 mm -hmm. to hand over to, to the Nazi. Um, of course, that's, uh, uh, it's no point, you know, starting discussing the whole injustice behind that. But uh, uh, is there any ethics that, uh, you know, we can consider to make that, that choice? But we, we have to face that choice. So. Uh, how often we should at least feel a little bit better in that you're doing the, the right choice somehow. Yeah, sometimes there will be answers that we can get. I mean, this is the interesting thing. I mean, because you talk about, you know, as I, I use Socrates' example of the traditional approach, but it's not like I'm unaware that there are other approaches to philosophy in the Wittgensteinian criticisms of Socrates, for instance, right? Now, one of the nice points that Wittgenstein makes is that, you know, sometimes sort of over there is the best answer you can give to the question as to where the thing is, right? Now, the point he's making is that we can't always give precise answers, that sometimes we have to give rough and ready answers. And sometimes, you know, the answer, it depends what you mean, is often the most honest answer you can give. Now, with some of these questions, there will be correct answers, and with some, there won't. 
right? So, for instance, you know, the thing about me, I am not committed to a radical principalist view, for instance, whereby I think that you can't possibly all ever decide whether one human life is worth saving rather than another. Right. So that, you know, the thing I was three people, I was like, which ones are pull out of the burning building? I, I, I can see there's some situations where I just wouldn't know. And it would just the answer will be just plain arbitrary. And we must not rule that out methodologically. So part of the problem that I have with the bioethics discussions is it's to do with, you know, you start off doing something which is legitimate, having a sensible conversation and bringing in philosophical theory as, as of, insofar as it helps to decide what should be done in certain situations. But at the point where it becomes, uh, you know, this, this talk about once the decision has been officially made by the committee and it's an objective principle, it then has authority in some way that it didn't before, that's where I start to get concerns, right? Because it seems to me, you know, like with the, you know, I would have no problem whatsoever, you know, so even like pulling someone out of the burning building. And, you know, there are plenty of situations. Quite frankly, you have, uh, you know, if you had Greta Thunberg and Donald Trump lying there, I wouldn't have much of a problem in pulling out Greta and leaving Donald to the flames. I would think about leaving Donald anyway, even if there was no one else to pull out, right? Because there are all sorts of, you know, there are all sorts of issues. Um, you know, what you wouldn't be doing is if you have three young people who all look roughly the same, trying to look at them carefully so as to determine which one had the best quality of life process ahead of them when they when you pull that but no you just have to decide randomly in that situation um but there are all sorts of criteria that we can legitimately employ in certain situations the problem is having it so it becomes a point of methodology that there must always be a non-arbitrary answer to such questions that's where it gets problematic because then you start to protect the background assumptions from scrutiny Sometimes in the artist spaces of industry doesn't mean we can't often make the best of it in practical situations. So one of the things which I wasn't able to talk about there was the distinction between, on the one hand, philosophy in the sense of when we're coming to our honest conclusions that we say about and tactics that you use sometimes. So I gave you, Marco, an example in one of our email exchanges where some Bob Brescher had um the philosopher from Brighton had put some uh, uh, commenting on something I'd written a good long while ago now. He put some very astute questions to me and he said, so come on, Lachlan. He says, are you seriously saying that philosophers should never sit on ethics committees? Now, it would be incredibly hypocritical of me to say that because I have sat on ethics committee. And the situation in question, um, when our university was setting up its ethics committee, and there are all sorts of problems about, you know, as you say, they are quasi-legal things. They're not really philosophical things. But nonetheless, it was being set up. And my head of department at the time said to me, Michael, you can basically chair the ethics committee and you can decide who's on it if you want to. And I think you should do this job. And I said, why, John? And he said, well, listen to me. He said, you've written on it and stuff like that. I said, John, so I have written stuff critiquing the idea of ethics committees. Right. And my reward for that is to be made head of the ethics committee. Isn't it a bit strange? To which John replies, all right then, Mace. He says, if you don't want it, I can think of somebody else who really liked the job. And he went, really like it. She bloody relish it, Mace. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm... And I realised what he was saying. There's a woman in the, in the department who she would love to be head of the committee because then she would immediately make it hell on earth for all their colleagues to get any of their research proposed. If, you, if, if someone who's coll who she disliked was trying to get a PhD student's research, she'd make it absolutely... She'd, and she'd make life a general bureaucrat nightmare and so I could see what he was saying so I said okay I'll take on the job thank you John of a head of the ethics committee because then I could make it as reasonable a process as possible for people and I thought this is you know I'm the I'm, this is the closest I'll ever get to being a, uh, what's it, a platonic philosopher king because what I've done here is I have taken on this role because I realized that if I didn't take it on someone would take it on who actually liked it someone who loved the role who as he said would relish it and he's the only way that you know plato you know plato's imaginary philosophers take on this role of leaders because otherwise it's going to be the bolsonaros and the boris johnson the donald trumps who in fact lead, the people who want power and they're the ones you should be most afraid of so in in, in plato's little fantasy of that you know in the republic that's why the philosophers end up taking the role of philosophy not because they want the power but because they realize if they don't do it, somebody else will, who does like the job and would want the power. And so it seems to me in all sorts of ways, we compromise with our underlying philosophical beliefs 
you know, ta- and so long as we can give an overall justification of that in a personal context, tactically, yeah, you know, and this is one of the good things about proximity ethics is it allows you to be more of a particularist than a principalist. If you see what I mean, you know, it's, it's well, you'd be more Aristotelian. You know, in some situations, you can accommodate things which might seem like inconsistencies because you're not just a philosopher, right? But you are a philosopher and you have to, and you still want to promote that level of underlying thinking. And you certainly don't want, you know, I would certainly be embarrassed if someone had come along and said, well, look, who, you know, told someone else to shut up because a decision had been made by the Ethics Committee. And Michael's the head of the Ethics Committee, so he speaks with a good deal more authority on ethics than you do. I have to say, I, I feel, I have to felt deeply embarrassed by that. Because we know that's not true. The fact that I am a philosopher doesn't mean that my opinion, you know, my opinion is more valid than the someone who hasn't been trained in philosophy because, you know, it isn't. There are good people and bad people and there are people who are trained in philosophical ethics and they're not the same at all. You know, so, so you know, if someone asks me, uh, who do you, you know, who do you want, if I had to ask someone about how to understand a particular passage in Aristotle, and someone said, you can either uh, ask, you know, the, the, the conservative philosopher Roger Scruton or you can ask your mum, uh, I'd have to say I'd rather ask Roger <laughs> because ro- my mum's, you know, was a working class woman. She never did any philosophy. But if someone said, who would you like uh, to make decisions on behalf of your daughter? If you know, for some reason I couldn't, you know, she, who would you like to, as to how she's going to be brought up? Roger or your I would say my mum and almost anyone but Roger. You know, because I think, oh, my, you know, knowing the things he's said and done, I think, oh, my God, you know, um, I, you know, so there is difference between person being a good person and person being a good philosopher. And we have to be clear in ourselves about what that distinction is and that we don't have special authority because we have done philosophy. But nonetheless, there are certain times when we can make important contributions to debates. And so one of the things which we mentioned in our, in our energy discussion was, you know, the thing about dialogue, because I think that Toulmin, a lot of applied uh, ethicists quote him, but they don't always go into detail about what he says. And I remember when, when I was studying him a few years ago, he talks about the role of dialogue and how philosophers dealing with non-philosophers can have an incredibly important role in asking the right questions. And he noted could bring people around. You could have more agreement about decisions than you would initially have thought if you have the, a, a sensibly led discussion with a philosopher there to bring out people's underlying assumptions. And I think I wrote about this in a, a book on methodology and medical ethics in that Bloomsbury. Yeah, James Markham's book, the blue, in the, the, he edited the Bloomsbury Companion to Medical Philosophy. But, you know, philosophers can have an important role in applied debates. That seems to me, I'm not saying that they can't. I just, it's, I worry if you end up being politicised to the effect that you end up sitting on a committee where you sort of claim that because the committee has made this decision, it's now authoritative and everyone else should somehow just accept your authoritative decision, then I'd start to get nervous. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, and I mean, I, I like to think, I mean, I think about, you said, what was the example you gave about putting someone on the, one, not wanting, once you put someone onto a particular machine, not wanting to take them off it, was that the example that you gave? Yeah, I mean, I was wondering, I think, you know, again, philosophy, I mean, it put me in mind of some of the debates that, you know, you know, Thomas Nagel, The View from Nowhere, which was in the 80s, he talks about that kind of decision where he says, you know, about subjectivity and objectivity, he says, to some extent, the, the ethics of the subject, once you've gotten involved with a certain person's situation, you've committed yourself in a certain way, and that can be relevant, and that can put restraints on what would otherwise be nice, simple Benthamite thinking, where you would immediately say, right, oh, that person looks more likely to benefit from this take that one off the machine um that sometimes there is but it's to do with the the ethics of our relationships there the fact that you've got involved by putting that person on it's like almost like you know adopting a particular child you know once you've done that you have certain commitments even if some other child comes along who is more needy you know so there's there's, there's it seems to me there's, there's philosophical thinking can be <laughs> I don't think it can give us a final authoritative answer, but I don't think in philosophy that's not what we're aiming for, is it? Okay. I don't know if that makes sense. Is that is that a kind of is that an answer? Yeah, I think for me it is. I don't know, Marco. Uh, oh, I got it. I got it. Uh, I think we uh, we don't have any more questions, but uh, one one point more I would uh, address to Michael is 
we are talking about ethics, Michael, but uh, ethics is a, a, a field in philosophy and it's supposed to uh, make contributions, etc. But uh, in uh, other part in philosophy is, uh, uh, for example, when we uh, try to discuss some uh, practical issues in order to understand uh, the presuppositions and the rationalities, for example, that are in confront or uh, at, on the table. Uh, for example, in COVID-19, uh, the different uh, uh, solutions or uh, uh, people are presenting to the uh, pandemic uh, involve different conceptions of rationality uh, about, for example, not only priorities, but how we uh, uh, should reason about the, the problem. Uh, for example, uh, uh, precautionary approach, uh, 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 questions about reasons to do, uh, reasons for action, but reasons for action is taking as, uh, 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 taking as uh, premise uh, for example, facts about the disease, the pandemic, the, the, the incidents, etc. And so uh, we philosophers also reflect on the, uh, the different rationalities that are in discussion. So uh, we are not always uh, trying to uh, present solutions. We are uh, sometimes trying to understand what is yeah. uh, 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 what 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 is in the discussion in the public discussion uh, or in the specialties? Uh, uh, mm. My my point is that uh, 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 no, no, for example, when when uh, 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 when you entered in the discussion uh, now, when you entered in the discussion of ration, for example. Uh, 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 we, uh, uh, when I read, for example, your answer to Madison at, uh, uh, at all, uh, I, I could uh, understand, for example, some issues uh, in even Wheeler's point, for example. For example, I, 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 I can understand Wheeler's point as a kind, uh, not only of uh, physician's point on his commitment to the patient, but on a more uh, broad conception of the value of the ethics of proximity. And so I, uh, uh, in discussing the issue uh, mm. of ration, the ration debate, I can uh, understand other issues uh, uh, that, that are important for uh, philosophers or for not only for, for us as philosophers, but for, for all people. Yeah. So I try to make what I said is a reasonable answer, answer yes. to the unreasonable man's point. But um, so, no, but that seems to me a reasonable use of you know. I mean, you look at a reasonable use of philosophy. If you're looking at the underlying, you know, you can bring some debate. If you're looking at the underlying mechanisms and processes that lead people, and, you know, let's face it. Had we taken the precautionary principle more seriously, how different would the world be? You know, when you think about, you know, you think about the uses of precautionary principle in environmental uh, debates and so forth, you know, had we actually taken that more seriously, how, you know, would we have allowed the world to operate in, in a way that has generated such a high risk of so many catastrophes, um, simply because it was considered too, now, too difficult not to. And of course, that brings us, in, it, it, it borders all the questions, because obviously as philosophers, we can ask these underlying questions, but social scientists and social theorists will tell us a lot about why it is that the debate is not more rational and what forces are at work and what we would have to change to make debates more rational. And we're seeing all this interesting stuff now about the anti-science propaganda and, you know, the, you know, the, the, um, the, sci the different kinds of science deniers that we're now seeing. So it's gone on from denial of environmental science to a more broader movement. You know, we're seeing all the, you know, the insane of some of these American internet movements that have, you know, that again, have some of them that have the support of the president. Um, question, you know, and some people like, you know, so, you know I mean, Ross Upshaw, Maya Goldman have done some of this interesting stuff on, you know, the deterioration of trust in science and the development of, you know, forms of rhetoric that try to undermine 
scientific thinking. And these are important areas that we have as philosophers need to get involved with as well. The relationship between, it raises underlying philosophical questions that take us right back to medieval times, that take us right back to the relationship between rationality and trust. And what, whatever we think about religion, one of the unfortunate impacts of Lutheranism on modern thought was dividing, bringing an absolute divide between the notions of trust and reason, right? Uh, whereas the old fashioned Aquinas view came from Aristotle and said that the two of them are related, that there are, you know, so you read people like Honor O'Neill, you know, there are rational questions you can ask about who should I trust. It's not just that you just happen to place your trust, your faith in one person absolutely as opposed to another. But we need to, one of the things, you know, that a lot of the people are saying how we need to save science from this kind of weird so-called, you know, sort of, you know, anti-science post-truth era that we're, that we're wandering into, you know, the worst possible time in human history, you know. Um, one of the ways we have to do to, to do this is to get people to think more about questions about who should I trust? And that's where I think, you know, philosophy has an important role in collaboration with other disciplines. You know, because one thing that won't work is if you just say, I'm a scientific authority here and all these anti-vaxxers are raving mad and uh, don't listen to them. Well, no, people who go to the University of Google and read the blogs will read much better blogs than that that will convince them to join the anti-vaxxers. Right? And that means if you ever do find your vaccination for COVID-19, the vast majority of the population won't accept it. Right. So where will you be then? You know, so we do need to solve these broader social problems or else we're going to kill off the social impact of some of the most important progressive developments that we've seen from science. You know, medical science, we bloody need it. Right. And we need to explain to people why we need it. Right. And that, again, so that's where, you know, you have to have that kind of joint debate where philosophy is important because the philosopher can ask the naive questions and can stand back from the whole thing. But then you say, but isn't that at a certain point then we don't we need this kind of social theorist in here? You know, we need to comment on different types of rationality and we need philosophers, social theorists, scientists and all sorts of others to be engaged in the debate. And we have to try and make it a sensible debate. And at some point we have to figure out in terms of you know the ethics of debate where we do have to rule out certain contributions as just willfully damaging, which they are. You know, we saw that in the recent American president's debate. You know, at some point, someone is basically just standing there shouting, shut up, shut up, and shouting over you. At some point, you have to say, no, this isn't a debate anymore. And some of the stuff that's put out on the internet, it needs to be exposed as just plain dangerous. You know, so we have to have all further discussions about who we do engage in rational debate with, with rational debate with who we don't. We have to be willing to debate with people with whom we sometimes radically disagree. But then there are some people whose actual philosophy, when you understand this, is opposed to the very idea of rational debate. And then we have to consider, do we wish to exclude them from our table? You know, in the same way that, you know, I've, you know, I've said I would, you know, for many, many years, I would not sit at a table and debate with open racists and fascists because, you know, they are opposed to the, the very underlying idea of sensible open debate. They want other people to be barred from the table just because they don't look like me. So, no, I'm not going to sit down at the table with someone who thinks that other people should be barred from the table for that kind of arbitrary reason. So there are all sorts of debates we need to have about the underlying question. Philosophy, your the underlying reasoning, it's really important. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm not saying we shouldn't be engaging in practical debates. It's about, you know, thinking carefully about what impression we give and what, what, are some, what assertions we make about our status and what we don't. But dialogue, yeah. Dialogue is yeah, the dialogue that we need to, develop, to, to generate. Okay. Very well. Well, with this thought, I think I should uh, go to the end of this. I don't know what time is there, uh, Michael. It should be like uh, over midnight, I guess. Oh, yeah, 20. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 20 so, hours. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, no, it's a great talk. It's uh, <laughs> we start to think about it, and then passes uh, time passes. You know, just flies away. You don't even uh, notice. Uh, so I'd like to thank you, Michael Lachlan, for a very nice presentation. Uh, I was very curious. I start reading some of your uh, articles. Actually, Marco uh, sent me one, and I found it very interesting indeed. Uh, make you think about you know things that you are not uh, used to think. You know when making decisions and rationing. That, that was very good. Uh, can, oh, 
down you can download ethics management and mythology from the internet that's you know for, for, for nothing so if you want to have a look at that that was one, that was one of the earliest things and a lot of the things haven't it'd be nice to think the world had changed dra drastically since then so that those arguments were out of date but i don't feel that, <laughs> that they are unfortunately okay uh, <coughs> no, okay so thank you um, thank marco gostaria de agradecer thank também you, thank o you, ricardo okay thanks so. Okay, so thank you, Michael, for your talk. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Obrigada, Ricardo, Marco. Good night. 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 rest. Hang on. Yeah. Bye. 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 Boa noite.